Okay, so John 17 is uh, a long chapter and it takes up about half of the book. So what we're going to look at in this next session are just really a few snippets uh, from that prayer and uh, especially the first few verses and then one of the verses towards the end, verse 24. So, uh, but it's good to read that prayer for context and uh, awareness of the words of our Lord. So uh, John 17 is, is one of those uh, sections in God's words that uh, you feel like you as a Christian are entering into the holy of holies. Uh, John Calvin said, we have the heart of God as soon as we place before him the name of his son. And so while we come before God in prayer in the name of Jesus Christ into the holy of holies, there's a sense in which once we get in there, often uh, we don't know what to say, how to say it. But when you come to John 17, you don't need to say anything. You just need to read and meditate and listen. And, and J.C. Ryle actually called this the most remarkable chapter in the Bible, which sounds something like Martin Lloyd-Jones would say. Whenever Martin Lloyd-Jones was preaching on a passage of Scripture, he'd say, this is the most amazing passage when you think about it. And it's like every passage he was preaching on was the most something. But I think Ryle, being a little more sober-minded, uh, being an Anglican, uh, probably was on to something when he called it the most remarkable chapter in the Bible. A little bit earlier, Philip Melanchthon said that no voice has ever been heard in heaven or on earth like this prayer offered up by the Son of God himself. And John Knox, when he was dying on his deathbed, his wife read to him from John 17, where he first cast his, his anchor uh, others, a little more pious, have said, well, we dare not preach on John 17, which uh, I don't know why you would say that, but it seems like one of those pietistic things to say. Uh, we're going to, to look at John 17, and, and what may be, what may be, not is, uh, one of the greatest sermons ever delivered in the Upper Room Discourse by Christ to his disciples is followed by what may be one of the greatest prayers ever offered up to God the Father. And, and so John chapters 14 to 17 really give you a, a body of divinity and a picture of, of Christ's heart being sort of unveiled or, or even exploding before the Father. Now, the words that he uses in verse 1 where he lifts his eyes to heaven and he said, Father. I want to just focus on that word, Father, for a little bit. It's, it's actually interesting that the first recorded words of Jesus speak of his allegiance to his Father. And the last recorded words of Jesus speak of his trust in his Father. So, in Luke chapter 2, verse 49, these are the first recorded words of our Lord. He said, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And then his last words, then Jesus calling out with a loud voice in Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, now, this may seem a little bit ordinary to us, but in reality, it's anything but. For the simple reason that referring to God in prayer as my father was virtually unheard of in Christ's time. Usually, Jewish people referred to God in prayer as Yahweh, or my Lord, or my God, or the God of my father, but the words of Christ in the Gospels, when he prays to God as his Father, simply have no precedence. In fact, one of the great New Testament scholars, Joachim Jeremiah, said that we can quite deliberately say that there is no analogy at all in the whole literature of Jewish prayer for God being addressed as Abba. 
This assertion applies not only to fixed liturgical prayer, but also to free prayer, of which many examples have been handed down to us in Talmudic literature. Now, it's very interesting that Jesus would use the words Father in prayer because he is revolutionizing the way we approach God in prayer in a manner that does justice to the revolutionary nature of his ministry. You see, from no previous examples of faithful Jews addressing God as Father, we now have the supremely faithful Jew referring to God as Father almost exclusively in every prayer of his. And so, as many of you know, the word in Aramaic is Abba, which obviously refers to a father-child relationship. And before Christ's time, children would have uh, learned to refer to their father as Abba and their mother as Imma. So during Christ's life, Abba was used not only by small children, but also grown children would refer to their father as Abba. In fact, uh, to address God as Abba, not to address one's father or to address one's mother as Imma, but to address God as Abba would have actually have been deemed disrespectful by the Jews. But Jesus does precisely that. And in fact, if Jesus was not who he said he was, we would have grounds for joining with the Jews in accusing him of blasphemy. Remember that in John chapter 5, verse 18, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Why? Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. You see why it's a little bit revolutionary for someone to refer to God as their father? Because a Jewish person then understands that if God is your father, you must be his son, and they are saying you're making yourself equal with God. And, and we're not speaking about Jesus, the son of God, as a mere earthly king, as we read of in 2 Samuel 7, but rather we're speaking about the eternal son of the father and a unique, special relationship that we hear of in other prayers of Christ. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, he says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. And here's the key for you and I. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So what you under, need to understand first and foremost is that there is no precedence for what Christ does during his time. And the reason why Jesus refers to God as Father must be one of necessity because of who he is. But I think there's another reason. Jesus also receives the spirit of adoption. And because of the powerful indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Jesus can't help but call God his Father. Just consider that the Spirit is not only of the Father, but also the Spirit of the Son. So in the Old Testament, in many places, we're told, especially in Isaiah, of the fact that the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon God's servant, his Messiah, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Now, going forward to Isaiah chapter 42, God speaks of his servant whom he upholds, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations." And then in Isaiah chapter 61, that is again affirmed, and that's what's actually quoted by Jesus in his sermon in Luke chapter 4. Now, why do I make this an emphasis? Well, if you keep on reading in the New Testament, notice that if the Holy Spirit is poured out by the Father into the heart of the Son, 
it might be that he would so frequently and naturally and joyfully call upon God as Abba Father. Because that's precisely what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 and 16, and a little bit later on, that the Spirit does what? The Spirit bears witness to us that we are children of God. So, if the Holy Spirit is poured out upon Jesus, would the Spirit not bear witness to Jesus that he is the Son of God? So why does Jesus call God his Father? One is because that is his identity, and he has the peculiar privilege of bringing that name upon his lips, but also because he possesses the Spirit in such measure that he can't help but call out upon God as Father. Now, returning to our friend Spurgeon, he said, if any man of woman born might have lived without prayer, it was surely the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm very grateful that it was the Baptists who invited me down to Sydney and the Presbyterians couldn't be bothered. But if I might just disagree with Spurgeon, I don't know if that's allowed. <laughs> I think rather the opposite is the case. I think there is no conceivable way that Jesus could have lived without prayer because of who he is and what God does to him means the only acceptable and fitting and natural response of Jesus would be to pray. Either, otherwise, he would have been the most frustrated human being ever to step foot on this earth. So that word father at the beginning of his high priestly prayer is absolutely essential to what then takes place. Because what we have is a copy of what Christ prayed as our intercessor in heaven. If you want to know what Christ is saying in heaven for the sake of the church and for the sake of your salvation, here it is. And when he goes to heaven, he is not going to heaven as someone twisting God's arm, but he's going to heaven as God's son. So Jesus then naturally in verses 1 and 2 prays concerning eternal life because that is really ultimately why he came to earth. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And so the rest of the prayer is actually an unfolding of what eternal life is. What is eternal life? It is explained from verse 2 onwards. And we're going to look a little bit at that. What does he mean when he says, the hour has come, glorify your son that your son may glorify you? Well, I think it especially manifests itself at Golgotha, at the cross. The cross glorifies God and Christ in a way unlike any other time in all of redemptive history. Why is that? Because nowhere else in redemptive history, nowhere else in the scriptures do you so clearly see the coming together of all of God's attributes so cleanly and perfectly and vividly as in the death of Christ on the cross. You see God's wisdom in the way in which he orchestrates all of world history. You see his goodness in giving up his son for us, his love, his mercy, his justice, his wrath, his faithfulness, his power. You see God vividly in Jesus Christ on the cross and thereby the Father and the Son are glorified. That is why Christ can say that he will glorify the Father, and the Father will glorify the Son, because the Son 
is God's instrument to bring glory to his name. And Christ continues to speak about this matter of authority, which is a major theme in the gospel narratives, that Christ has authority. It begins in Luke and John and Matthew and and Mark, but in John 3, verse 35, notice why Jesus has authority. He says, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Why does Jesus have authority? Because the Father loves him. And so when he says in John chapter 17, since you have given him authority over all flesh, you could also say, since you love me, you have given me authority over all flesh. And why would we say that? Because he is his father. Or John chapter 6, verse 37, all that the father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And verse 39, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. So notice when he says, you have given him authority over all flesh, he continues to say in John 17, verse 2, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. In other words, what he's saying in his prayer in John 17 is actually just a summary of what he's been saying throughout his ministry about the fact that the Father has given to him a people. So in John chapter 10, verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. Or John chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. So Jesus is aware that the Father has invested in him authority, and that authority results from the fact that the Father loves him, and the way in which the Father loves him is by giving him a people. So what does Jesus then do? He prays to the Father, and he reminds the Father of all that the Father has promised him, which is why so many have said that prayer very often is simply going to God and reminding God of what God has already promised to give us. It is an asking of God, but it should ordinarily be an asking where there is a promise attached to it. Otherwise, you run the risk of presumption. God has made certain promises, but to pray for a Lamborghini which some do, is presumption because there is no promise. So Jesus clearly is is sort of taking everything in his ministry up until this point and and crystallizing it in this prayer and opens with, with a bang, so to speak, by addressing God as Father, which immediately arrests the Father's attention because who's speaking to him? His Son. And the Son is reminding him that the Father has given him authority, but not only authority, that the Father has given to him people whom he is now going to pray for. So then what does Jesus pray for in verse 3? This is, uh, this is the verse I put in books when I, when I sign and say a little message. and uh, I'm left-handed and my signature is never ever the same, ever. You, if you can find me the same signature I've done, uh, I would love to see it. And I, I always wonder what happens in America when people, you know, they come up with crazy requests, you know, like sign a Bible. I'm like, I didn't write that. <laughs> I don't think I did. <laughs> and sign hymnals, which is a little less blasphemous than signing a Bible. I could circle Mark. Uh, But this is the verse, this is the verse that almost always I I sign off on because I know people generally are going to go and look at the verse that you you put. And and it's one of my favorite verses because it really sums up uh, the Christian life and and what eternal life is. So remember, eternal life uh, has been described in many ways by people and 
And, and really, it can be a very sort of simplistic that you can have your sins forgiven, which is, of course, true and glorious. But Christ actually explains what eternal life is. He says, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, this is a most remarkable prayer, because Jesus is a man on earth, and he is praying to be heard by others that they should know God. And every faithful Jew would say amen, that they would know God. That is how they live their lives, to know Yahweh, to know his commandments, to read of his actions and deeds. But then Jesus has the effrontery to say, well, what is it really to know God? The only way in which true knowledge of God is attained is when that knowledge of God is attained with an and. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And those words are absolutely vital because Jesus is saying that to know me is based upon the fact that I've been invested with authority because the Father has sent me. So to know God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, this is absolutely vital to our apologetic as Christians. This is vital to not only our personal life, but just how we think about what really is important. It's not enough for us as Christians that people believe in God. That is not what Jesus is praying for. We are not even theists in the general sense of the term. Oh, you believe in God. Oh, I believe in God. I remember some Mormons coming to my house, and I said, oh, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm a minister. They says, oh, wonderful, you believe in God. Excellent. Well, can we just leave this with you? And, and away they go. They're happy. We believe in God. And then the JWs come, and my, my daughter or one of my kids came to me, Dad... There's two people outside for you. <laughs> I can't tell you, it's, it's, it's like, you know, kids who believe in Santa, sorry, but um, Christmas is coming. You know, for me, a couple JWs coming to the door. I just, I get excited, sorry. <laughs> and we believe in God. But really... Eternal life is not simply to believe in God. We are not on a, on a crusade along with Muslims and Jews and any other theist. We believe that eternal life and the only true knowledge of God is the true knowledge of God, whereby it is consistent with the true knowledge of Jesus Christ, whom he sent to be the mouthpiece of God, the visible image of the invisible God, God's representative, God's king and prophet and priest. And so eternal life can never ever be eternal life unless it takes a person to the point where their knowledge of God is distinctly and explicitly a knowledge of Jesus Christ himself. Do you want to know what God is like? Know Jesus. Do you want to know what Jesus is like? No God, and there can be no compromise on that point because that is what Christ has prayed for. Now, as the prayer unfolds, we, we see a lot of what eternal life means. We, we see something of the nature of the unity of the church and, and so on, but I, I really want to focus on verse 24, which is after verse 3, probably my, my favorite verse in, at least in John's gospel, but perhaps in all of God's word. It's a, wor it's a verse worth uh, dwelling on and meditating on. And, and again, notice that Christ addresses his father again as father. And this is something of the nature of true prayer. It's not a sort of mindless Lord, Lord, Lord. We just Lord want to Lord. It's rather an intense father. And he speaks with clarity and understanding, but he can't help escape the fact of who he is addressing 
And that means that he has to say father again. And it, it is interesting to notice how many times he repeats the word father because of how intimate this prayer is and who he is praying for. And notice what his desire is. He has a desire. We might say that what Jesus wants, Jesus gets. And I suppose if you were to say that of any other human being in the world, it would not be a, a compliment, except of our Lord Jesus Christ. I desire, and he's asking, and he's pleading, and now he's making known to the Father what does he want? I desire that they also, whom you have given me, where have we seen that? At the beginning of the prayer. He is again reminding the Father of those who have been given to him, and those alone he has a desire that they may be with me where I am. To see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Uh, there are a number of applications and points that we can make from this verse. The first thing I'd like to say is that this particular verse has an extraordinary power when it is applied to Christians who have experienced the death of a loved one in Christ. And everyone in here will likely have to deal with the fact that a loved one in Christ will leave them. And in the church, we have, or at least we're supposed to have, many fathers and, and brothers and mothers and sisters that is a gift that God has given to us. So even if we do not have immediate family, we have family regardless. And death, as you know, is a reality that we all have to deal with, not just personally, but it's something that, that affects everybody. And that is why we are told by Paul that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And it is a, a real enemy. It's a, it's a frightening enemy enemy and some of us have watched people die in front of us and many of us have have lost friends young and old and it's always ugly it's sorrowful and there's there's nothing wrong with sorrow and heartache in the face of death in fact our lord jesus christ himself wept over the death of lazarus now that's important for christ it's important for you it's important for me because death is unnatural. And when we lose a loved one who is a believer, we need to keep in mind something very important that will help us to deal with that. And I can't think of a verse that I would rather preach on or minister to someone than verse 24. Because in chapter 17, verse 24, we read words that on prayerful Reflection should be very close to our heart when somebody dies. Now, notice we read verse 24 earlier. Then I read it again. Now I want you to read it again in light of this sort of introduction where I have put death uppermost in your minds. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So Christ, as we saw, has certain desires. And he had desires on earth. He had the desire to eat and drink. He had the desire for friendship and fellowship. He had the desire to worship God. He had the desire to pray. But he also has desires in heaven because he is still fully human. Just as he is truly and fully God, he is fully human. And we have heard of desiring God, but nobody quite desired God like Jesus did. But if you wanted to speak of desiring man, you can say that nobody has ever desired man like Jesus did. Think about that. The God-man, has anyone ever desired God as much as Jesus? No. Has anyone ever desired man as much as Jesus? No. 
He is the God-man, and he desires both. And he makes known to the Father his desires. He speaks as often as he has before that of those the Father has given him. We've seen that earlier. Those whom the Father has given to Christ are those for whom he lays down his life. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so Jesus has natural desires concerning them. And what is his desire? His desire is that his people be with him. Christ has certain unfulfilled desires in heaven, even now. He had unfulfilled desires on earth when he was tempted and he was hungry and starving and thirsty. He wanted to eat. And they were unfulfilled. But nothing can compare to the unfulfilled desire he has. Not that it causes him any suffering, but he still nonetheless has a desire that is unfulfilled in heaven. Even though he is completely happy and satisfied. Now, what does he desire? He desires what? Not just us. He doesn't just desire you. He desires and has prayed that you, if you are a Christian, should be with him. Now, where is he? He isn't here. He's at the right hand of the Father. By his divine presence, he is here. But in terms of his specific identity as the God-man, he is in heaven, and he is making a prayer that you and I should be with him. So what happens if a loved one in Christ dies? Well, you can explain it by natural causes. You can explain it by biological causes. You can explain it by murder. You can explain it by a whole host of ways. But if that person is a Christian, I can tell you something far grander than that, that Jesus has actually had his prayer answered. So he has gained what? He has gained more than what you have lost. So the person, not just Jesus, but the person who has gone to be with the Lord, have they gained more than what you have lost? The answer is yes. If Jesus has gained more than what you have lost, that person necessarily has gained more than what you have lost. That is not to diminish the pain and agony of someone dying, but it is to put it into a greater perspective that Jesus has actually prayed for that person to be with him, to see his glory. So that when a loved one in Christ dies, the Father is actually answered to the request of the Son. So God, through his Son and for his Son's sake, cannot lose. And what I mean by that is that Christ gains and those who belong to him gain for the simple reason that God cannot be defeated by death. So yes, we have lost, otherwise the person would not be a loved one, but we need to see that that person has been given to Christ. And Christ has desires that are unfulfilled, and until every last person who has been given to him by the Father has seen his glory, Christ will have an unfulfilled desire. Now, what does he want them to see? He wants them to see his glory because he knows that we are also unsatisfied. So until we see his glory, we will also necessarily be unsatisfied. And I call it a sort of holy excitement between Christ and his bride, a holy excitement whereby he desires to be with us, we desire to be with him, and the only thing keeping us from him and him from us is actually our death. So he wants them to see his glory. And this is actually a very prominent theme in Paul's uh, treatise in 2 Corinthians chapters 3, 4, and 5, especially because in this life we walk by faith, not by sight. But in this life, faith transforms us from one degree of glory to another into the image of Christ. As you live by faith, 
you are beholding the glory of Christ by faith. And as you behold the glory of Christ in 2 Corinthians 3.18, you are being transformed into his image, into his glory from one degree to another. So what does that mean? It means that if by faith you are longing to be with Christ as he has prayed for you to be with him, you are longing to see him. But because you live in this world, you cannot see him by sight yet, so you must see him by faith. But every true child of God will necessarily, because of this prayer, have a longing to see Jesus Christ. So John Owen, he describes the desire of Christ for us to see his glory And he says, this alone, which is here prayed for, will give us believers such satisfaction and nothing else. The hearts of believers are like the needle touched by the lodestone, which cannot rest until it comes to the point whereunto, by the secret virtue of it, it is directed. So he's talking about how do we ever find true satisfaction in our life, and it can only be when we are finally directed to the point of our existence. So I know that the language is difficult, but he says, For being once touched by the love of Christ and receiving therein an impression of that, that secret virtue of Christ's love in our hearts, we will ever be restless until we come to him and behold his glory. That soul which can be satisfied without seeing his glory is not actually a soul that has been a partaker of Christ's words for that person. In other words, what he's saying is that no one can claim to want to enter into heaven and see Christ's glory who does not in some sense and to some degree desire to see Christ by faith in this life. So what Christ is asking of you in glory, to see his glory, is not something that is a sort of new thing. It's a continuation, albeit on a greater level, of something that's true of you right now. That you see his glory. In fact, I might ask the question, you have a conference next year, if all goes well, and my, I think my brother Joel Beakey, not my real brother, I can assure you, but spiritual brother, is coming, and um, I am able to say, well, you know, you can have Joel Beakey, or you can have the Lord Jesus Christ do the conference, and you have to make a decision. And it's interesting to me that when John Owen is ruminating, not on that particular example, of course, but he says that as redeemed sinners who still have indwelling sin, the glory of Christ now in his exalted state is too high, too illustrious, and too marvelous for us in our present condition. It has a splendor and glory too great for our present spiritual faculty. We would not be able to handle it. In other words, you would be immediately, two things would happen. If you are a sinner not in Christ, you would be immediately consumed by the holiness of his presence. Or if you are a sinner in Christ, you would be immediately transformed by his presence because the presence of Christ and the sight of Christ is actually transforming. Why do we know that? Because it is the sight of Christ by faith in this life that is transforming. So your sanctification grows the more and more you look to Christ, know Christ, meditate on Christ, and Christ is preached. That's why it's so important for Christ to be preached from the pulpit. Because that is the number one means by which the Spirit is going to honor the preaching. And that is the means by which you're going to be more holy. And that is actually a fulfillment of Christ's prayer. 
so that we get to Revelation chapter 22, and what do we find? They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. As Thomas Manton, the Puritan, said, we need no other books than beholding his glory. Christ in his glory and eminency is Bible enough. So what does Christ ultimately want for you? He wants you to be in his presence, to see his glory, and so he prays that to his Father. So now you need to think of Christ's intercession in this way. He comes to this earth. He's aware that the Father has given to him a certain people. That enables him to be sustained in his ministry, to die on the cross, knowing that his death will not be in vain. And as he is raised from the dead and ascends into the heavenly places, he calls upon God as his Father. But as soon as he mentions your individual name even once you are as good as saved think about that what happens if jesus mentions your name just once to the father will the father reject the request of one who has been so faithful no will the father reject the request of one who is his only begotten son no will the father undo his promise no So that when God hears your name, he will do everything in his power for the sake of Jesus Christ to have Christ's prayer answered. So you can be certain of your heavenly inheritance, not ultimately because of anything that you do, but because of the words that have been offered in this prayer. So, in conclusion... We can say that departed saints in this life have an added advantage over those of us in Christ who are still in this world. I mean, we mourn the the death of of loved ones in Christ, but, but when you think about what Christ has prayed for and that what Christ wants, Christ gets, and that the person who has left us is beholding his glory, and that Christ is satisfied in that beholding because he has actually desired it more than the person has desired it themselves, it puts a whole nother luster on the glory of his prayer, which actually is fulfilled, is it not, in the dying thief who says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what does Jesus say? He basically says what is the fulfillment of John chapter 17, verse 24. Today you will not go to heaven. That's the biggest lie in the world. Today you will be with me in paradise. There's a, there's a big, big difference between saying someone's in a better place. There's a very big difference between saying somebody is looking down on us now. If you read verse 24 of John chapter 17, and then you are able to say as a Christian, well, they're looking down upon us now. Something is not going right up there. Because Jesus has said, I desire that they behold my glory. So what we believe as Christians is eternal life is not only knowing God, but knowing God through his Son. And the goal of eternal life ultimately is to get those whom the Father has given to the Son to see the Son's glory and to be with him. And not until then can we say that all of our so great a salvation has been fulfilled. Well, time for questions or anything else? Now, I was just wondering if you could help us understand why did Jesus' commands and prayers both so heavily emphasize the need to love one another and his desire that we would be one? If you could help us understand why and what that looks like. His desire for us to be one. Uh, I think uh, you can look at that a whole number of ways. Uh, one, one would be an obvious way of saying the desire for us to be one is a desire that since for a very long time, namely eternity, you are going to be that way, 
uh, what redemption does is it brings eternal realities, heavenly realities, into the present. And with the life of Christ and his death and resurrection, sort of heaven gets stretched back into earth. And so it's only fitting that the unity we should have in glory and the love that we should have for one another in glory should actually be a present reality even now on earth. So I think that's one reason why it is so heavily emphasized because your life is like this compared to eternity of, of going around for, for a billion years and only then just starting of what your existence is going to be. Uh, the other reason, I think, is because if Christ comes into the world and displays love, but a love based on unity, and we are the bride of Christ, we actually have to reflect who our husband is in our daily lives so that Jesus will say in this prayer that I am glorified in them. And he's speaking of the church. So why should you love one another? Why should we have unity? Why should we promote the truth, which is also in that prayer, sanctify them in the truth? Because we glorify Jesus. He is glorified in us. So his mediatorial glory is actually a glory whereby what we do and what we say and how we act really does actually have implications for Christ's glory because he is sanctifying us and in sanctifying us, his bride, the bride glorifies the husband and vice versa. So those are two answers. There's, there's lots of other ones I'm sure you, you, all, you all know. Those are in light of the prayer. Many clergy preach expositorily through books, the most common that I'm concerned. You're preaching on a chapter in John. Yeah. But we seem to miss out because clergy won't preach on hell very often or they might refer to heaven. Uh, I'm concerned that we often lose a particular point and theme by this period of going through scripture uh, without addressing a subject like you're addressing today? Yeah, I mean, I've, I, I'm going through the book of Romans in Vancouver, and it's, it's basically verse by verse, and I know that, you know, you, you have to deal with everything that God's word gives you, but you know, I, I kind of learned over the years, this is a personal reflection. I'm not making this an absolute thing. I've kind of noticed that there's some guys who will still go through verse by verse, but if they don't really want to preach on something or apply it, it's easy for them to, to still skim over the text. Uh, and I've seen guys who preach topically or on top, and they, they can bring it home. So for me, it's more of a case of, uh, whether the pastor's got the, the fear of God and the, the integrity and all that to, to really say what is God's word saying because expository preaching, I've, I've heard some lousy expository preaching that doesn't actually hammer home the points. It's, it's more like a Bible study or an exposition of this is what it's saying, but it's not, it's not actually brought home to the people. And, you know, this is more of a even... You know, I'm doing a conference, it's more of a, a lecture-like format and not preaching, but still, um, that's just been an observation of mine. So yeah, I think expository preaching is good, I do it, but I don't think that's ultimately the solution. There's still people who do it, and I, I, I'm not moved at all by what they say. I just find it grotesque sometimes. Again, personal observation. Clarify, did you say that Christ needed the, Holy, feel, the filling of the Holy Spirit? Yes. To, to do his work? Yes. Okay, I've, I don't <laughs> think I've ever heard that or even thought about it that way. Um, sure, just, that's I've good. Heard, like when he was baptised, the Holy Spirit rested upon him. Yeah. And I'm assuming those around could see that. Yeah. Could you just sort of expand on that? Sure, or clarify, yeah. Please? No, that's. Uh, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, there, I don't know if there's any copies of Knowing Christ left, uh, but I have a chapter on, on the work of the Holy Spirit in Christ, but a sort of summary would be that uh, because his obedience 
for our sake had to be true human obedience. He's, he's, where Adam failed, he's succeeding, and, and his obedience is not a, a sort of Superman going around and sort of the divine nature allowing him to do all these things. He does not actually depend upon his own divine nature, but rather he depends upon the Father who pours out the Spirit upon him to do everything. So in Luke's gospel, for example, there are so many references to Jesus doing things in the power of the Spirit, or in Matthew, casting out demons by the power of the Spirit, or going into temptation in Mark 1, where the Spirit drives him there, or where he offers up his body on the cross in, in Hebrews, uh, where Hebrews 9, uh, where by the eternal Spirit, or the Holy Spirit raises him from the dead. Um, the point is that his obedience had to be true obedience, and the pattern for Christ's life in the power of the Spirit then becomes the pattern for our life, that all of our obedience must be done similarly in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what he offered to God in terms of true human obedience was real human obedience, but it was spirit-empowered human obedience, uh, not just God taking care of everything so that when he's starving in the wilderness, it's not like, oh, you know, I'm God, I'm not really that hungry. You know, when angels come and minister to him, it's not a case of, well, I guess we should do something. I mean, he really was emaciated and, and at the point of death. Um, so I think that's the key, is to, to see the Holy Spirit as, as the Father's provision for him, according to his human nature, to fulfill all that the Father requires of him, but for it to be true human obedience. So um, there's a lot more to say on that, but... Um, yeah, a lot of people have that reaction. Um, I can only say read uh, Knowing Christ, and if you want a more difficult uh, learning curve, read John Owen. Uh, and if that doesn't satisfy, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, that's a, that's, a sh that's a short answer. But read, read Luke's gospel and notice how many times he refers to the Spirit on Christ. It's, it's really quite remarkable. Mark, you mentioned John Owen. Which volume of Owen or which one of his works do, did you make reference to, please? Try volumes 1 to 16 and whatever you can, you can find. Uh, I think if you look at volume 3, I would like to say page 160. It's a wild guess. If we can find it, I'll confirm it later. I, volume 3, 160, 165 in there might be the Spirit's work on Christ. Um, but let me confirm that. Let me confirm that later. If, if I do get it right, I'll definitely confirm it later. <laughs> As I was saying. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Sinclair Ferguson in his book on the Holy Spirit has a very good section too uh, on that. But um, yeah, if you have that book, I would suggest also reading Sinclair Ferguson. Um, yeah, and then the other Puritans did talk about it that way too. Just to prepare you, I'm going to ask you in private uh, on page 50 in your book. Uh, knowing Christ. I know so, Owen better than I know my own books, by the way, okay. so I have no idea what. what. Um, about Jesus having a created soul. So I'll just created talk. soul, yes. Yep. Okay, um, so I'll come and talk to you about that one because um, you wanted us to stay on topic. Um, but my question is That's what motivated relevant. you? Sorry? That's pretty relevant. Okay, uh, yeah. and also what motivated you to write this current book on prayer? Okay, so he has a true human nature and a true to be a true human and to redeem humans we are consisting of body soul we're body souls and as uh, we read in the apostles creed a, a reasonable soul so the human nature of christ consists of body and soul and mental faculties and his soul and body it's real so when the son assumed a human nature into subsistence with himself, he assumed a true body and soul. And that body-soul composite was the uh, principle by which all of his religious actions took place. So when we see him praying here, he's praying according to his body-soul. 
and his soul needed prayer, just as his body needed food. Uh, because a soul that doesn't commune with God is ultimately unsatisfied. That's what Augustine says, that until we're satisfied in you, we will remain, you know, our souls will be uh, at unrest. So that's that. The, the motivation to write this book, uh, I think maybe knowing Christ, I saw was a, a real blessing in various countries and languages, and I still thought I maybe could use some of that to then move into a, a book on the prayers of Jesus. And I didn't actually see that many books out there in the modern church on the prayers of Jesus. I, I, it was really a struggle to, to find some. So I thought, well, here's a chance where people probably, if they've read Knowing Christ, might say, okay, I, I, I didn't mind that. I enjoyed it. I'll read the prayers of Jesus. And you'd kind of see there a, like a bit of a companion volume. So that's, that's why. Uh, Knowing Christ is way better. <laughs> But it's still worth reading, I hope.